your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to Like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water, your forgiveness. Like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears. Verse 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. that we have mercy through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the price that was paid on our behalf on the cross. We, we look at ourselves and we say, what am I? I'm nothing. And you say, no, you're a child of mine. You're, we are children of God. We are redeemed and we've been set free. We're not who we think we are. We are who you say we are. Amen.
goes on around us, all the strife, everything we see, we are children of God. Your word says so. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's, that's the reason that we're here today. That's the reason that we worship you. The reason that we praise you.
forward to that day. We're going to be where the song goes on and on. We're going to gather around the throne with the saints. We're going to lift up your name. Hallelujah, Lord. That'll be a great and glorious day. Thank you, Lord. And while we're here on earth, Lord, let us be about doing the Father's work. Let us be about doing the things you've called us to do. Like Peter, sometimes we're called to step out of that boat. We're called to step into the unknown. Lord, let us follow your lead. Let us keep our eyes on you every step of the way. Hallelujah.
Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. My faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. upon the waters wherever you would call me take me deeper than my feet could ever wander my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior Spirit lead me where my trust is without borders let me walk upon Fantastic. So, Kathy, why don't you come and, and share your testimony? And, and remember, it's glory to God, it's not just moaning. Is this one on? It is. Do I need to press anything? A pusher? Oh. <laughs> Some of you guys know that... Um, We've been going through a little bit of a, what would you say, a dry time. Uh, my husband has been uh, down in Roseburg taking care of his sick father. His, his father has been his last weeks, probably. And so he hasn't been here. And, you know, I, I was really seeking God about um, not just coming to him for my request, but I wanted to be able to be in the presence of God. And God revealed to me that, you know, what do you, what do you like, you know? You like it when people come and they tell you, you know, things that God's done through your life, you know? And, and you, you can give God glory, and, and it just really hit me that I needed to start coming to God and just exalting Him. And, and telling him everything that he was doing and giving testimony of his glory and uh, this is hard okay because uh, I don't want to make this about me and I have a, a tremor and when I get emotional I shake more 
But God's grace is sufficient for us, and his power is made perfect in our weakness, and it's not about us. It's about him. So ignore that. <laughs> anyway, uh, so what was really cool was the Lord showed me how to do what I'm calling a God press. You know, we give the enemy a lot of press. We talk about all the horrible things that are going on in the world all the time, and, and it just comes natural to do that. But the Lord showed me, come and exalt me for the things I'm doing. Look, on your own perception into what's going on. What am I doing? And start to give him glory for the things that he is doing. And so my husband would call every night, and... And we kind of get into this thing where he'd say, what, you know, what's the, the God press? What's God doing? And our, our perception changed. We started to see it through his eyes, and we could see the miracles that were happening. We could see how God's cleaning house and that he's ordained this time. And uh, anyway, I, it was very exciting. <laughs> and for about a week, we were doing this, and this one day, uh, I just started praying for, you know, the family and, and everything. And, I mean, the Holy Spirit just came on me. I was praying in the Spirit. It was one of these moments that I know you know what I mean. It's like, it's so all God that you're just, you're, God is, you know, there. And you, I, I, after I got done praying, I felt so much confidence, so much confidence that God was moving. And I didn't even know all the ways he was moving, but I knew he was. And I, I felt so confident that God was moving. I was just go on top of the world. Anyway, and many of us understand Psalm 91, we read it a lot, but there's a couple of verses here. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And what is that? I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and fortress. My God in Him I trust. That's why I had all that confidence, was because it wasn't that bad things were going on. It's that I trusted God that he was doing something in it, and I was praising God. I was on top of the world. Well, uh, I was given a lot of uh, God press. You know, we started this with our college age group, too, and uh, where we bring a card in. This is what these little cards are here. Everybody brings a card, and they put their God press on it. We're going to start a God press wall. And that's uh, our testimony for what God's doing. Well, two weeks ago, on a Sunday, I uh, was coming out of a store, and I started to cross the parking lot to go to my car, and I, I was, tried to run across because I thought there was a car coming, so I just tried to get out of their way, and somehow I tripped. And I fell really hard uh, on my face. And I think, you know, my, my wrist too. But uh, I, thankfully, one good thing about these masks is uh, I had my mask on. And I, I'm not really a big mask person. But somehow I hadn't taken it off yet, which kind of saved my face a little bit. And um, anyway, I hit so hard that I thought, oh, this is, this is bad. I thought I broke my teeth. That's how hard I hit. It actually almost went through my lip, my nose, my eye. And uh, when I hit, I thought, well, this is, this is bad. And I, I was really disoriented. And, but then the, the thing that came to my mind was, oh, Lord, you must be going to bring something really good out of this. You know, because you don't think that way unless you're really in God's presence. And this is what we've been, I've been doing for weeks. So I knew God was going to bring something good out of it. Well, let's, let's read this next part. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. There was a snare there. It wasn't that nothing was going on. But guess what? All of a sudden, God surrounded me. I was by myself. God surrounded me with all these people. 
these beautiful people. I mean, literally, it was like God's feathers surrounded me. And all these, and I was laying there, and I felt like I couldn't get up. I, I was disoriented. I didn't know if I had concussion. And they just surrounded me and totally attended me. And I kind of look up at them, and you know, they look kind of worldly. A lot of blue hair and different things. I'm telling you, these people were the most beautiful people. It's not about what it looks like on the outside, is it? You know? And they were attending to me. They were being so kind. And, and uh, everything that God would do for me, they were doing for me. They were calling the paramedics and, and different things, you know, to make sure. And finally, at, at one point, uh, you know, I took off my mask a little bit. And I'm bleeding from my nose, from my lip. Um, and the... Uh, the lady, a couple different people were like, oh, she broke her nose, you know, I mean, that's how it was, you know, that's how bad it looked, and uh, I ended up calling Zach and Sarah, and they came over, and I was just waiting for somebody that I knew, you know, and Sarah came over there, and I was kind of hugging her, and then I was able to just release, and just started to cry, because it was like God was just holding me. Um, I started to try to get up, this is in the course of about a half hour, and uh, was pretty dizzy, so they took me to the hospital um, and to make sure I didn't have a concussion, and all the, the paramedics were saying that I broke my nose, the doctor when I got there said I broke my nose, and uh, anyway, there was a couple things that God did while I was, uh, you know, before I got into the uh, ambulance. He just showed me all these people that were surrounding me, and he said, you, you, you tell them how much I love them. And I said, I love you guys so much. You know, I mean, it's the little things. You don't know, right? I got into the, uh, into the ambulance, and uh, all, it was just, the picture on the back of the ambulance that has the staff with the, um, with the snake. And I, somehow I was kind of focused in on that. And I was asking my the paramedic or the guy there, young, found out Christian guy. And I think God used it to build his face. And I said, what is that? What does that mean? He said, well, remember, it's from Moses. I don't know if you guys know that part, you know, where God had him hold up the staff so that they would remember not to grumble because the serpent, the serpent had come and bitten them and it was like they took a place to all of this, these words, you know, pastors been speaking about words and, um, and I said, oh, that's right, that's what that is and I said, well, are you a Christian? And he was a young guy and he said, yeah. And I think the other paramedic wasn't. I you know, just kind of didn't get the feel. And I said, well, you can pray for me then. And, you know, he didn't pray right now. I never know how God uses these things. I got over to the hospital and uh, called Patty. Patty prayed with me. Sarah was on the line telling everybody, you know, <laughs> in college age and stuff. I had a lot of people praying. Zach called Tom, and he was on his way. And uh, Tom told me that his whole family gathered around. broken bones, and I said, really? And she said, no broken bones. She goes, I can't believe it. It's like, I, I was sure you broke your nose. I said, well, I said, I had a lot of people praying for me, and 
she got a big smile on her face and said, well, you know, it's kind of an agreement. I think that you had a really good support system. And I believe the Lord healed my nose. I mean, this is two weeks later, and for that to all happen, um, and for me to have, like, one more little, you know, place on my face, um, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him, or her in this case. And, uh, you know, that's just what God did. You know, I, I fell. I said, God, help me. He surrounded me with feathers, all those people. I called upon him, and he answered me, and he healed me. All glory to God. Thank you. I will tell you, she looked like a little raccoon, though, when she came to work. <laughs> Two black guys. <laughs> she had a good attitude. And God is in the healing business. Amen? Still doing it. Well, elephant in the room, this is Halloween. We don't talk about that. Yeah, we do. We're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. Halloween, a believer's response. Why are we doing this? When Paul is before King Agrippa, and he is explaining himself, he's explaining his conversion, he's explaining what's going on at the end of Agrippa, says, well, slack off, I, you've almost got me getting ready to get saved. And Paul says, but I wish that you would. So as he's explaining to King Agrippa what's going on, he says, this is what the Lord said after he knocked me down. Uh, I would deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Paul's mission is to turn people from darkness to light, from Satan to God. Well, the highest satanic day of the year is today. Today is Halloween. Today is about 2,500 years old. It goes back to the Celts, it goes back to, the, uh, to Ireland, it goes back to Wales, it goes back to Scotland. It even goes back to practicing Celts in Gaul, which we now call France. The Druid priests practiced the religious observance at the end of their harvest season. This is right now, this is the marking the end of a year. It would be like New Year's for us. November 1st would have been like the first day of the year, and this is their high season. It's uh, to honor their uh, Samhain, the Celtic god of Celtic god of death. It believes they believe that the souls of the dead were allowed to wander around at night and wreak havoc. Um, they would sacrifice not only animals and they would sacrifice humans. They would read their intrals to find out what was going on, what was going to be in the future. Um, we're talking about some serious sick stuff. Well, the church being the church. Uh, oh, by the way, Julie, what did Julius Caesar says? He says, they believe that human life must be rendered for human life if the divinity of the immortal gods is to be appeased. So they were appeasing their gods so the sun would come back. They were appeasing it. And there's a number of the things I won't go into. But one of the things that the church comes along, like we do with so much other stuff. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong. But they decided, hey, the world is really looking at this, and there's a big influence on this all the, the, this night of the dead. You that just came back from Mexico must have seen that going up everywhere. We've been down there for a few Halloweens. And so the church says uh, Pope Gregory this fourth 
says, we're going to, in 1858-853, we're going to declare that November 1st is a day to honor all the saints. So we're going to honor all the saints that have passed, and we're going to sort of push out this uh, Halloween stuff. It wasn't Halloween. It becomes Halloween because it's All Hallowed Saints Day. So it's All Hallows Eve. And so now we get Halloween. Um, second busiest holiday of the year. We're going to spend in America $8 billion, $8.05 billion dollars for candy and decorating costumes. And that's down from 19, 2019 when it was $8.78 billion. It's a lot of money for tooth decay. And more decorations go up this time. Only Christmas gets more decorations in the yard and in the house. Horror flicks are all the rage. Try to find... Patty was gone last week, so <clears throat> i, I got to find some movie. There's no movie that's worth watching. One horror flick after another. I mean, there's some gross... Hit. You, you look at just... They come on on a commercial, you're going, whoa, who watches that stuff? Now, I know a lot of Christians think it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. They just... You know, it's make-believe, and I know it's satanic, and I know it's this, but it's not a big deal. Well, listen to what the Bible says. Psalms 101, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away, like uh, demons. It shall not cling to me. Here's the problem, and I don't mean to be picking on you, but I am. If you are into watching horror flicks, especially demonic horror flicks and that kind of stuff, it will cling to you. It will cling to you. There's no if, ands, or about. You just might as well say, whoop, come on in, demons. Here's an open door. Just come on in and wreak havoc in my life. When I was a paper boy, I've told the story before. I, I was in seventh grade, and uh, in Eureka, you, the paper goes Monday to Friday after school. And then on Saturday and Sunday, it's the, the, the you have to have them delivered by 7 or 8 or whatever it was. And so I'd come rushing home from uh, school, from, uh, junior high school, and I'd fold the papers. I mean, I, after you fold so many thousands of paper, here I am, 60-some, 60 60-year, 60 55 and I could do, 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 rubber band. I'm, I, mean, I can do it in my sleep. But what I would, when I would fold the papers, there was a thing called dark shadows. Now, if you remember dark shadows, and I, I didn't know much about anything. I was in seventh grade. And every day I'd watch dark shadows. And that's pretty cool. You know? And so one Saturday morning, it was blowing, and I was about five something, and just a normal October day in Eureka just blowing sideways, pitch black outside. And I started to go up a street, and I looked up the street, and there was a guy just moving, and he was screeching. And I remember thinking, I'm going to die. He's going to suck the blood out of me. I knew I should have had garlic on my toes. It took me what would normally be five minutes. I mean, I went so slow hoping he wouldn't see me. I was hoping he'd move away, but he just stood there, just swaying back and forth and screeching. Just you could hear it. And I finally got close enough. It was the gas station sign that swings back and forth this way. And the wind was blowing it back and forth and it was all rusted and so it was squeaking and screeching. Now we think, well, that's funny. But the reality is, I've been watching dark channels. That stuff will cling to you. Look what David says. That stuff will cling to you. It'll get in your heart. By the way, we'll, we'll talk about this sometime. Christians can 
be tormented by demons. I will put nothing wicked before my eyes. I won't have stuff wicked before my eyes. Go on with that thing. I've only watched one, quote unquote, poor flick in my life. And I was living by myself, a senior in high, I think I was a senior in high school. No, that had to be at first, because I just bought the house. And it was, again, perfect day in Eureka. And Eureka doesn't get much thunder, hardly any. But this one was a thunder and lightning and rain coming down sideways. And boy, I had my house and, and you know, my, my, my couch was on, my, my soup cans held up my couch through and uh, and a 13 inch black and white color tv and i'm watching night of the living dead and i'm going oh, whoa 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 and kaboom i mean the whole house shakes and everything goes black all the power goes out after i change my shorts I, I, uh, I loaded all my guns, I locked all the doors, and I've never forgotten it. And that's the last one, I just won't do it anymore. But we in the church, I know so many Christians, that's not that big a deal. It's, it, but the Bible's real clear about that. It'll cling to you. One of Satan's most effective tools is fear. I don't know why people love to be scared. Especially by the demonic. Don't open that door. And if you come to me and you say, well, it's not that big a deal, I'm just going to say, okay. Do not come crying to me. I'll let you do that. I love you. When you run into the problems. There's a story of a uh, a young native, and he had to go on his, his mountaintop journey to as he became a young man. And so he climbed up the mountaintop, and he's got to spend the night there. And usually in some cultures, they get their spirit guide, a relative to guide them through life. And, but it, they, 13, whatever the age is, they have to do this as part of their turning to manhood. And he gets up there, and it's pretty chilly up there. And he looks down, and there is the biggest rattlesnake he's ever seen. I mean, it's huge. He goes, what in the world is a rattlesnake doing up here? And he just jumps back, and the rattlesnake, help me. Help me. I'm not touching you. You'll bite me. You'll kill me. No, no, I won't. I'm too cold. <laughs> Would you take me down? Put me in your, in your jacket and just take me down and put me on the, on the desert floor and I promise and I'll tell all my family they can't bite you. I, I promise if you'll just save me, just, just let me in. Just put me into your, your coat here and, and just take me down. I'm just, I'm going to freeze to death. I just, you know, it's okay. And the little boy, the young man was going, no way, I know what you are. And finally he relents because the guy was persuasive. Snake was, so he puts the snake in you and he starts the next morning walking down. And then the more he walks down, he's carrying a huge snake and he's warming up and the snake's warming up. Finally, he gets down to the desert. He goes to put the snake on the ground very gently. Boom. Snake just latches on it, just pumps venom into it. Why? You promised. You promised. You promised. You knew what I was when you. See, we think we're the exception to the rule. We think if we play in sin, we think if we play around with the demonic stuff, it's not going to open a door in our lives. I'm telling you, folks, it is. The Bible is very clear. Stay away from it. It's no big deal. It's just a game. It's just a magic eight ball. It's just Ouija board. It's just horoscope. By the way, the Bible directly says don't try to read in the stars your future. It's just a fortune teller. By the way, I, I've had a Christian tell me, you're wrong on this one. Just because I take a personality in a game 
And that personality leads me in this game. And I assume that personality. Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, there is something wrong with that. But you can't. Here's the thing. I'm trying to tell the church on, Val- on Halloween. Look, folks, this is not an innocent day. Deuteronomy 18. When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who takes his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. We know that was a very common practice to offer your your child to a deity. One of the interesting things that they have shown, they've they've unearthed how they did it. They would take a long metal pole and they'd sit it in the ground and they'd take what looks just like uh, like an an 1800 tractor seat. Big tractor seat, you know, sort of scooped out. It's all metal. They build the fire. tie the kid on and the kid would roast you won't do that but oh we we think that's terrible what do you think about abortion that child is trying to get away from it but we're gonna cover it in acid or chop it in pieces while it's alive you shall not There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughters pass through the fire. Or one who practices witchcraft or soothsayer. Well, I'm a good witch. I'm a white witch. I'm a wicked. No, wicked, that's just wicked. This is the word of God. Or a soothsayer or one who interprets omens. Or a sorcerer or one who conjures up spells, or a medium, or a spiritus, or one who calls up the dead. How many of you saw the movie Ghost? Whoopi Goldberg and... uh... I'll tell you one thing about that movie. That movie does the best presentation... of somebody being hauled away to hell by demons. The demons coming up. I, that, that's the only redeeming factor besides Whoopi Goldberg is hilarious. Of that movie. See, the thing is, you can't play with the demonic. You can't mess around with it, or you shouldn't. You can if you want, but you shouldn't. For those who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. Please take a listing of all the things that God has said is an abomination. For those that do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these things, and because of these abominations, the Lord will drive these nations out in front of you. So there's two points here. Why is there such a strong warning against occultic practices? Now, see, I know a lot of Christians, you ask them, I won't say it, I bet you if I ask you your sign, you could tell me your zodiac sign. The Bible's real clear, don't do that. Don't even try it. People ask me, what's my sign, Ross? My sign. Most of you weren't, well, some of you were. That was a big thing back in the 70s. Everybody, hey, what's your sign, brother? Before, I knew what it was, a, a bowman. But after I got saved, I can't remember who told me. Said, My sign's either the empty tomb or a cross. I'll take that. I'll take that. I, I'm trying to tell us, folks, Halloween is not a day to be celebrated. People are going to die today. People are going to be sacrificed today. Oh, not today. Not now. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. And when you think about it, you need to pray against it. 
Well, yeah, you're sure a spoil sport. What I'm trying to be is a pastor that tells you God doesn't want, he sets you free. Well, I got to get one good ahead of myself. The nations that were destroyed because they practiced those things. What's the second thing? There is real divination. There is real witchcraft. There is real omens and interpretations. There's real sorcery. There's real casting of spells. There's real mediums and spiritualists, and it's not harmless fun. In the high school group, we were talking about, what, what you guys have, what, what do you do about God? Nobody believes in God, but they sure believe in the demonic. And I, we, we, I, I have some great men of God in the group, and, and young men. And, and we were talking back and forth, like, what do you mean? Oh, no, everybody talks about the devil. We talk about witches. We talk about all this kind of stuff, spells or anything like that. But you, nobody talks about God like he's not real. See, that's exactly what Satan wants. Satan wants you to think that God doesn't have much to do with this all. He just, you know, deism. He, he created it and like a top. He spun it and said, okay, catch you later. No. He wants to lead us day by day. He has a plan for every one of our lives. Every breath that we breathe is a gift from him. And these high schoolers are telling me that, yeah, yeah, they, they, they talk all about the witchcraft, they talk about this, they talk about that, like it's cool. And what's happening is they're just opening their doors, just opening their life up to the demonic. And like that snake, you can carry it a long time. And, and tragically, here's the tragic part of it is, most of them, don't realize what they picked up. Satan has conver- convinced the world that he's nice and that God is not real. Why are we doing this? I tell you what, we shouldn't be. And, and I, I'm gonna, I prayed this morning, Holy Spirit, convict any of us that are into any of this stuff. Convict us. Repent of it denounce it anywhere you're involved in cultic practices. I just read my horoscope every day. No. The Lord, the word's real clear about that. It's real clear about that. We should not be doing this but I'm telling you, it will cling to you. What does David say? I'm not going to set my, I'm not going to get involved. It'll cling to you. It'll cling to you. You ever walk on tide flats that are mucky, muddy? You can't get that stuff off. And just clings to you. Oh, better, better than that. When you're commercial fishing salmon, salmon, you got to be down in there, and they, they pour in the salmon, and you, you know, when you're gill netting, and then you got to get it ready and put it up, and you know, of course, you're wearing a hat and stuff. But stuff when they pull it out and take it to the tender and drop it off a huge bag with thousands of pounds of salmon in it some stuff just presses out on you and you shower when you get home until then you just stink and you shower again and you shower again and you shower again I have come home a month after salmon season in Bristol Bay a month I've showered at least once a day. I shower at least once a day. And after a month, I go, oh, that's still clinging to me. You just, right there's another scale. It's been there all that time. Just clinging to me. That's what David's warning us about when we dabble in sin. Especially when we dabble in witchcraft. I will set in a wicked thing before mine eyes. It'll cling to us. It'll bring demonic activity, fear, confusion into your life. And then Satan will use scenes from movies. He'll use all kinds of stuff to bring fear into your life. Perfect love casts out all fear. They need to understand God doesn't want us to live here. And I'll tell you what, it's really helped me 
just not to watch it. I was in, in eighth grade, and for some reason in our music theory class or whatever it was called, um, we didn't have anything to do, so she brought out a Ouija board, and she brought out a, a Magic 8 ball, and then she brought out Monopoly or Sorry or Shoots and Ladders or something that was more my style, candy man. But I remember the kids just gravitated shoop, right to the Ouija board. And I remember thinking, I'm, just, I'm not walking with the Lord. I'm going to Sunday school and, and you know, going to church with my parents. And I'm, but I'm just, I'm not touching that. That was the Holy Spirit keeping me. That was the prayers of my mom and my dad, my aunts and my uncles. That was the prayers of my Sunday school teacher keeping me from getting involved in that. I'm very concerned that um, we are deliberately opening the doors to many students. Students are having to pray to Allah, to bow and pray to Allah so they can learn the Islam religion, the Muslim religion. But oh, you bring a Bible to school, you're up for 20 years. Or the teachers in uh, San Diego that are teaching the kids to, to pray the prayers to the Aztec gods before they rip somebody's heart out of a living being. I do believe I'm probably going to get involved in the school. It's time that we stand up and step in. It's time we step, stand up, step in, and talk to them. We have the ability to change in the name of Jesus. So what's our response? First of all, we change our whole attitude toward the thing. 1 Corinthians 5, 17. If person, any person be in Christ, that person is a new creature. I don't have to go that way. I don't have to worry about all that other stuff. I can renounce it and let it go. Just don't pick it up again. And don't talk to everybody about it. Oh, I had this experience. And when I watched, uh, what's the movie where they turn their head around? Exorcist. It wasn't Exodus. <laughs> but see, the thing is, I learned from 1972, I never watched another one. And again, I wasn't serving the Lord. I was dealing drugs, but I wasn't serving the Lord. But I only dealt, I only dealt drugs that God made. I didn't deal manufactured drugs. Only what God put on planet Earth. Still bad. Still shouldn't have done it. You're right. I, you, you, you told me before I shouldn't talk about that. So, but I tell you what. When you're praying for your kids and you're praying for your nieces and nephews and when you're praying for your grandkids, well, you pray the head of protection about them. You, play, you pray for an angel with a big uh, paddle. Don't touch that. Don't go for that. I believe our prayers make a difference in their lives. We need to understand as believers we're new persons in Christ. We don't have to deal with that. Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things. Here, here's what we're supposed to be thinking about. Here's what we're supposed to be watching, Philippians 4 8. Finally, my brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate, think on these things. Somebody in our church posts every day. A couple of Bible verses, and they're always very encouraging. And I always hit like, I just, you know, that's what I'm thinking about. Not, not, not posting what's going bad in the world, but our God is greater. Our God is more than able. What's a Christian's response? Set your hearts on things above, not on the things below. What's your response? Therefore, James 4 7, therefore, 
submit to God. Now, some of you will quote the verse and leave off the first part. If you'll just resist the devil, he'll have to flee from you. No. He doesn't flee from you, he flees from God. It's God in you. Submit yourself to God. Live the godly life. Live a life that glorifies God. Live a life that's filled with the Spirit of God. Live a life that speaks the words of God. Live a life that's obedient to the word and the will of God. Submit to God. Then you can resist the devil and he will flee from you. Amen? we got, we got to get real clear on that. I see a lot of Christians naming and claiming, blabbing and grabbing, binding and grinding. And I'm going, whoa, 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 whoa. Have you submitted yourself to God? Is your life in alignment to the Word of God? Have you done what you're supposed to be doing with the Holy Spirit? Well, none of going to be perfect. As long as you are turned to somebody else and turn to somebody next and look at them. Okay, as long as that person is fogging up a mirror, they're not going to be perfect. The theme of this church is we're in a process. And every day, are you disappointed that you're not further along on the process? <laughs> but he who, but see here, it's God that's working in us. He who has begun a good work in you, he will complete it. I'm not trying to do it. I am just submitting to his love and his care and his voice and his word. He will complete the good work. Now, before I go, I have two more points. I am not trying to tell you you can't let your kids go trick-or-treating. Okay? I am not trying to say that it's evil if you hand out candy. We're not going to buy candy. We're giving those little kids those persimmons in their backyard. <laughs> I have more pers- I, I have the most fruitful persimmon tree you've ever seen. We filled four, five huge bags, and we didn't get one fifth the way into it. I eat persimmons. And that, I mean, I've never seen a tree grow like this. If this was, if that was a, what's that, Parma, if that's a parmigan tree, I'd be in heaven. I, yeah, we do everything we can to kill the thing, but it just keeps blossoming. Cut another couple limbs off of it. <laughs> Boy, where did that come from? That's part of the process of the redeemed mind. Now, our parents used to let us go trick-or-treating. Now, we could not, you got to understand, we lived on a dirt road with neighbors every half mile. Okay? Now, we would go as hobos, but you can't go as hobos because I saw that on the news the other night. You can't go as hobos. It makes, it, it's, it's inappropriate. It makes hobos feel bad. You can't go as Native American indigenous people because that's cultural uh, appropriation. So I guess the only thing left is I can go Superman. No. But that's what we always went as. And then when I got into junior high school, I went a little football player. But they would let us go. Of course, nothing demonic. We never went to a Halloween party. In fact, at school, when they, if they had a Halloween party they had at school, we weren't allowed to go into it. We were pretty strict on those things. Now, when we took our first church, we had three little girls, four little girls. Four. And my goodness, we're talking country. Country. And we'd always let them go. You know, of course, they never got to do anything demonic. It was always little princesses and, you know, that kind of stuff. And, uh, oh, my goodness, the church council came at me. And I said, well, you know, and then the Lord just gave me a nugget. Just dropped a nugget. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. 
<laughs> and that's what I told them. <laughs> and they backed off. <clears throat> but then all the almond joys had to come to me. I, I am concerned that all too many believers engage in activities that the Scripture strictly forbids. If you have a brother or sister, a friend that's in the Lord, and they're into horror flicks, or they're into the tarot cards, or they're into the... Just gently, you don't have to beat them over the head. You don't have to point the finger at them. Just gently tell them, that's not good. You're opening the door to the devil. And by the way, if you want to let your kids go trick-or-treating, that's fine. I have the verse. The Lord gave it to me in 1984. The wealth of the wicked is laid for the righteous. And those little punks tonight are going to get <laughs> We better not do that because they'll, they'll <laughs> beat our cars with them. <laughs> Lastly, and this will wrap it up, I want to talk about masks and costumes. The idea of masks and costumes is centuries old, and they wore masks and costumes, and they jumped over the fire because the, the demons couldn't chase them, and they thought the demons wouldn't know who they were if they dressed up and put a mask and a costume on, and they thought they could be somebody else. Demons aren't that stupid. Concealing one's true identity runs counter to life in the family of God. Sadly, all too many Christians never ha felt safe enough to unmask. We wear smiley masks to hide our pain because we believe we're never supposed to have pain. And how can I cry with those who cry and laugh with those who laugh if there are those who will never take their mask off of pain and they just keep that smiley mask on. Everything's okay. It's all good. We need to intercede for one another. We have people that wear their pretty masks to hide their faults. Their spiritual masks to hide their flesh. Those scary masks to hide their fears. Then, then there's those people in the church that, that, that they're so touchy. You, you, it, it, it's... it's just that it's an ugly don't touch me mask don't get close to me this is not healthy for the family of God none of these masks are healthy we need to be a church where people can feel free and safe to take their masks off I've known good people to have several, several layers of masks of one kind or another feeling that they needed them to be accepted and loved I think all of us by now are familiar with the devaluing effect of masks. Being a person that's battled asthma all my life, I don't wear one. A few minutes with a mask, I'm reaching for my little pepper, and I mean my asthma thing. It's hard to breathe, it becomes smelly having to remember always which mask I need to be wearing in front of somebody. Why are we doing this? Because we want to be loved and accepted. Perhaps we've never tasted or experienced the joy of just being accepted in Jesus is who we are. First sermon I preached in this church, I said something and I took it from a book by a man named Jerry Cook. And I read it in 1979, and it's been a foundational part of every church I've ever pastored. It's been the foundational part of where I meet with people. The minimal guarantee that I, we, must make to people. See, the people that come here, God led them here. God brought them here. The people that you meet, and you invite to church. That's the Holy Spirit working through you. The minimal guarantee I, we, must make to people is that they will be loved. Always, under every circumstances, with no exceptions. Some weeks ago I talked about the fact that when I first went to my first church in the small town and the young lady came and she was crying, I'd never met her. We talked about this. 
and she was just so, I, I've gone to every church that I can think of, I've gone to every pastor, and none of us will marry, nobody will marry us. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm pregnant. I'm thinking, welcome to about 30% of all weddings. Okay. And the reality is that I found out from the ministerial association that they'd made a thing, we're not going to, we're not going to <coughs> marry, we're not going to perform ceremonies for pregnant women. To be associated with him. You know, the guy that's marrying her. And so I did it. See, if we're going we're to guarantee to love people, that they know they're going to be loved, they'll come around. And better than that, Jesus will bring them here. They'll take their masks off. The minimal guarantee we must make to people is that they will be loved always under every circumstances with no exception. No exception. If the Holy Spirit brought him into our life, if the Holy Spirit brought him here, we get to love him to life in Jesus Christ. The second guarantee is that they will be totally accepted without reservation. Even if their organ state Totally accepted without reservations. The third thing I we must guarantee is that no matter how miserably they fail or blatantly they sin, unreserved forgiveness is theirs for the asking, with no bitter aftertaste. When we live out those three things, then people will begin to feel safe to take off their masks. They'll begin to feel safe to breathe the fresh air of joy and freedom and peace and love in the family of God. We need to be a place where people can take off. I'm, um, thank you, Hannah, for doing that. I'm going to have that redone, and we're going to read that at least once a month. And I was praying about this sermon, about that, and this came to me. I thought, you know, well, Lord, we need to keep something fresh in front of us. This will also keep us in check. It will keep us from judging others. As there's every one of us need those guarantees. Every one of us. If we will live these truths out, loved ones, we and those God brings here can begin to take off our masks and know the joy of breathing fresh air and fresh life. Amen? Is that still up there, Hannah? Is that still up there? Why don't I do this? Why don't we read it together? Would you mind reading it with me? The minimal guarantee... We'll go, okay, let me start over. We'll always do we. <clears throat> the minimal guarantee we must make to people is that they will be loved. Always, under every circumstance, with no exception. The second guarantee is that they will be totally accepted without reservation. The third thing is we must guarantee is that no matter how miserably they fail or blatantly they sin, unreserved forgiveness is theirs for the asking with no bitter taste left in everyone's mouth. We can then be a church that people can be free and they can begin to breathe what God has called them. And by the way, it'll help every one of us too. Why don't we stand together? Now, if you have kids going out trick-or-treating, 
Remember the rule. Pastor gets all homages. <laughs> My kids from Alaska will send me a bag of almond joys. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. You remember. Uh, oh, I'm going to eat that thing in half a flash. That's, uh, Father, I just thank you for what you're doing in and through us. Lord, I thank you for the grace that we've been given. I thank you, Lord, for the favor that we've been given. Lord, I just pray for grace and favor over each person here. I pray that as we go out from here, that we'd be aware of your voice leading and directing. That we would have these God moments where we would recognize what you're doing and participate with it. Lord, thank you for the privilege to love people to life in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I bless each person. I bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody who believes in Amen. Separate. 